Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'm William, uh, and I've been uh, using this natural language processing to make unstructured data highly accessible. Um, this has been a project at Arca BP. Um, Marsha and Peter are two other data scientists who have worked on the project, and uh, Veda Brecke is the project donor. He is in the room here if you, if you have questions. Um, so all of this work has been wrapped into a project called Pretty Polly. Pretty Polly is a document search engine. Uh, this, is, this is it in, in the browser. Um, so it's a standard document search engine. Here we have searched for machine learning and we get some answers. Very briefly, the reason it's called Pretty Polly is because the documents are all, all geotagged and placed on a map and then you can kind of draw a polygon and uh, limit your search results based upon that polygon. Um, we will be focusing on the machine learning, obviously, of Pretty Polly. Um, so importantly here, basically machine learning is tagging extra metadata on all of the documents with which you can filter your searches. So if I were to click on document types here, I would get all the document types that are in my search results, and then I could further click on one of these to uh, filter down my results to <coughs> just, for example, scientific articles or just peer-reviewed articles or such and such. Uh, to check that people are awake, there's a little Easter egg hidden in the slide that I didn't even know was here. Does someone see it? A little Easter egg. Uh, so so the, 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 the bottom result, I just did this, obviously I just searched for this because it seemed appropriate, and there was actually one, one document that came up which was from the Force, Force Hackathon. Uh, anyway, um, so yeah, Pretty Polly is uh, about to be sort of fully rolled out at Archibipi soon, and then, and then it will be commercialised sort of around the end of the year. These are some sort of fancy, nice features that it has that I won't get to talk about. Um, but in the time, we'll talk briefly about kind of the engine that the documents pass through in, within Pretty Poly. Uh, very slightly, the sense of content filtering. And the main thing that we'll talk about is the document tagging that happens within Pretty Poly. So this is kind of the engine. This is the, the, the workflow of a document going through Pretty Poly. So the basic idea is that. Uh, our company, RKBP, has a large number of documents that sit on some file system that any, everybody's just kind of put their documents there over a long period of time. These could be any type of documents, not just PDFs, but you know, Word, Excel, whatever type of document. And we want to make these documents extremely accessible you know, through Pretty Poly. So the flow is such, they go into the cloud. Um, and then we do this content extraction. So basically this is all documents get transformed into a JSON file. One of the fields is just the text content of the document, uh, and there's a bunch of other kind of metadata that are in those. Then these JSON files are enriched by various things. Uh, kind of the important one, and what we're talking about here, is the machine learning classification. This is just, this could give any tags that you want. At the minute, we basically identify the doc type. That's what we'll talk about in the talk. We also identify language and keywords, also metadata that you can kind of help your search with. The final little note, is that we have uh, a main index and a sensitive index. The sensitive index is obviously for, you know, you need uh, privileged user rights to access this. And some of the machine learning tags help the filtering between these two indexes. So we have to think a little bit when we do our machine learning that it could be, could be useful for this kind of filtering over here. And then obviously our enriched uh, documents go through to the kind of the net, you know, the, the interface that the user sees, which is what was on the previous slide. Okay, so uh, from, from the data scientist's point of view, uh, this is kind of what we have to work with. This is the data. Um, so there are something like 3.2 million documents. Of those 3.2 million documents, there's obviously many, many different classes of documents. Uh, but we currently only have 20 different classes that have actually like human labeled uh, names of the classes. And there are around sort of 60 to 2,000 uh, examples per class in those classes. So here are all the kind of different classes that we currently work with, and on the very far right, the number of examples that we have in those classes. So this, this small subset basically forms the training set for our machine learning. This means that we have a large undefined class. If you can do a tiny bit of math, then you'll see that this does not add up to 3.2 million. Um, so most of our documents are kind of completely undefined and have no label. As a little side note, we do actually have some kind of known unknowns that is documents that are actually tagged as being kind of from the unknown class. Well, basically, this means these documents here, this 459 or whatever it is, are not in any of these 20 classes here. So we can also use those in our trainings. Um, I will skip over this fairly quickly just for time. But basically, to note, there is also a feedback loop. 
So uh, we've had beta testers using this, and we have a few people that actually do some tagging for us kind of explicitly. But when users use Pretty Poly, they can re-tag documents if they think they're incorrectly classified, and that information kind of gets back processed through to the machine learning, and that those new labels can help the next kind of training. And then we would have some kind of retraining on some schedule. Uh, so basically, user feedback will improve the quality of the of the machine learning within Pretty Poly. Um, this is kind of somewhat a summary of all of what I've said from the perspective of the machine learning model. So this is the demands on the machine learning model. So the first obvious thing is that we have this large unclassified class. Uh, so this, so technically, this means we're doing open set classification. Uh, we will have a growing number of classes if we add additional classes with data and a growing number of examples per class. This is, this is like also a very good thing. Obviously, we want more, more data. Uh, the documents have multiple languages. The documents can are like extremely very documents. We saw at the start, these can be you know long word documents, or they could be you know uh, an Excel spreadsheet. And in particular, if they're something you know some more data type document, they can have completely illogical sentence structures. It could just be a list of, of headings of you know columns in a, in a, in a spreadsheet. Um, so this will kind of inform how we have to deal with our data. And then finally, this varied class importance. Um, one of these classes in the previous slide here. Uh, contracts. So this is an example of a class that we care a little bit more about because this is going to be used in our sensitive content filtering. So errors on that class are more kind of costly errors than other classes. So we need to kind of think a little bit about this. <coughs> so the so I guess is the meat and potatoes of the talk. This is what the machine learning model that we use is. Um, firstly, we simply train a kind of two class or yes no classifier for all of our twenty classes. So you know one for peer review, one for contracts, etc. Then to explain this, I'll just kind of talk about the predict journey of one uh, document going through our classifier. So we take in some, some uh, a document, which will be passed to us as a JSON file. And this is maybe kind of the, the, the text content of the document. <coughs> we apply some pre-processing, uh, various regex things, uh, and then and stemming. <coughs> then we do TF-IDF encoding. If you, if you know data scientists, science, you will know what this is. If not, then this just converts words to numbers. Uh, any machine learning algorithm can only deal with numbers, so we need to convert all our words to numbers. And then finally, we loop through all of those 20 yes-no classifiers and just get the probability that it is in that class. So the first one, you know, the probability it's a daily acquisition report is this very low number. A daily production report is also a low number, so on and so forth, through all of kind of the 20 classes or however many classes we have in our model at that time. And then we pick the highest probability, or we label it unknown if it's not above some threshold, in this case it's 0.6. This is kind of a hyperparameter, we could change this, but this is literally set at 0.6 in that model. So this one here, uh, you guys can, can think for a second, what would this be labeled? Obviously this is alone because the, the, the highest one is below 0.6. Um, I have uh, three final slides here, which are kind of just, uh, I, I would say the, the model previously is a fairly simple model. Um, and so for, for this kind of interested data scientists, there's kind of three kind of extra slides of kind of interesting things that we came across in this work. Uh, the first one is just a, a simple observation. You see all the time in the literature when people do uh, text encodings, <coughs> they basically just do some TF-IDF encoding and then that, that's the encoding of the whole document. Um, but we talked about having a JSON file with additional fields. And here we see that um, basically, when we're doing our encoding, I can use some encoder, which will give me basically that list of numbers that I saw before. If you, if you don't know anything about this, then just think out of this, I just get a whole bunch of numbers based on the words that are in the text. In addition to that, I can add the pages. So this is literally the number of pages that the document was. And I'm just going to have that, just encode that as a single float for every document. And note that this here will be mostly zeros and then a few floats. This is a float, and I can also add you know, any feature I want. In this, I add whether or not it was an encrypted PDF. <coughs> uh, and this is just a Boolean value, zero or one, and I would have another column like this. Um, basically, the way these get encoded, you always have sparse matrices. So I just convert these all to sparse matrices and then just stack them together. And in this way, I can add together a whole bunch of different features. And then, if the, if the uh, model I'm using in this case, we're using probably a random forest, sometimes next to boost. But if the model I'm using is some kind of tree-based model, 
it just doesn't care which type of input feature I have. So I can mishmash all these kind of different, <coughs> I mean, some of these are Boolean, this is very sparse, this is dense, but actually float values. Uh, so I can mix these together and, and, the, and the classifier still can understand what's going on. This is a really nice feature. Um, the other thing, so this is probably kind of, if I have spare time to think about what we really want to do in this project, this is kind of what I think about. And this is that most of the information is unlabeled. So most of the information in terms of like the data that we have, we're not using at all in the current scheme. So we want to kind of work out how we can use that unlabeled data to help our training. <coughs> One thing I tried <coughs> is that basically when we train all those 20 classifiers, we can take some extra random unlabeled data and add it to the training and just give it the label undefined. So if I have my class, let's say I'm training contracts, I have a whole bunch of contracts that are labeled contracts. I have a whole bunch of ones that are from the other classes. So for contracts, those are kind of undefined. And then I have my unlabeled data over here and I just take a stack of that and add it to the training. This has the advantage that I have a lot more data. So this is, this is good for machine learning. It likes to train on more data, but there could be some small number of errors. Some of the random stuff actually is contracts, then that will, yeah, that will lead to errors. Uh, so we tried this, and this is literally my notes uh, from, from that experiment, and basically with no additional data, we get, uh, we get better accuracies than adding you know, 1,000 pieces of, of kind of random data or 5,000. Uh, the with ROS, this is random oversampling. Basically here we're trying to get around kind of a, a technical problem which happens when you add just to one class, and even doing that, we do, it just doesn't help. So sadly, this, this idea does not work. Uh, another idea, um, and this we have not tried, but is that you can basically train your model exactly as we did before, and then predict your model on that unlabeled data. And then every time when you predict on the unlabeled data, something with a probability over 0 0.8, so you're really sure it's in the class. Again, if we were training for contracts, things with a probability of over 0 0.8 of being a contract, we give it the label contract and we add it to the training data set for the contracts class. And things under 0 0.2, you give it the label uh, undefined because you're pretty sure it's not a contract and then you add it to the training data. And then you actually just retrain the model. So you have this kind of two-stage training step. Um, and so this, uh, as I said, we haven't actually done this. It does work in many cases to kind of slightly, thank you, slightly increase your accuracy. The only thing is, if the initial model is based on a biased data set, you will not remove that bias. Um, and I think this, for us, this is kind of, this bit here is kind of the, the, the sampling problem or a biased data set. This is kind of my biggest worry, so th for this reason we haven't tried it. But you could do this later on if you kind of wanted to get the last few drops of accuracy out of your, out of your model. Um, and the final little thing that I'll talk about um, is overfitting. So uh, the total number of data pieces that we have, labeled pieces of training data, is something like 4,000, maybe a little bit over. And the number of words we have, which is roughly the number of features, is something like 20,000. Um, and because of this, you can see we can easily end up overfitting. Um, and actually, an earlier version of our model, for every single class when we train that classifier, we basically had a, loop, uh, had a list of different models and inside it, so we had a for loop, loop through all the categories and train a classifier. And for each category, loop through all of our models in our model list and train a classifier and see how good the accuracy of that particular classifier is and then pick the best one. So you just want the, the one that has the greatest accuracy and we'll save that one. But what happened when we did this, some really simple models, example, for example here, um, for daily mud reports, this is actually a decision tree it could find a word, cut, with two Ts, that completely defined that data set uh, and, and resulted in 100% accuracy. <coughs> and, um, so, and then obviously this would not work well kind of in a larger setting. If there comes a MUD report that doesn't have the word cut with two Ts, then it won't be defined as a MUD report. Um, so this was just to note, actually the, the decision of actual machine learning model was very important in reducing kind of overfitting in, in our training. Um, and this, so this here is an example from a random forest. If you think about the difference between a decision tree and a random forest, and you know about those two things, then you can kind of think that actually random forests would be a little bit more resistance, resistant against this kind of overfitting. Yeah. 
So we, we have now forced a random forest. We don't do this looping through the list because the looping through the list allowed us to easily overfit in this manner. Um, okay, so summary and some future plans. So we, we have basically, uh, we've basically talked about document enrichment <coughs> to help search within Pretty Poly. Um, and we built an open cl set classifier for long documents. I think this is very important that these are long documents because the, the type of classifier we use is completely different. And then we have this user feedback uh, as a part of our training loop. So this will be improved with, with use. Uh, we, we really didn't talk much about the pre-processing with encoding schemes and much about the handling of sensitive classes, but uh, feel free to ask if you have questions about those. Either myself or, or Vida are happy to answer. Um, and future ideas and problems. So uh, model evaluation is one that's actually quite a big problem here because huge amount of our data, again, is not labeled. So we actually don't know if we've predicted those things correctly. So evaluation is, is difficult and getting users will, will help that, but uh, a, a good scheme for this is something that's difficult. Um, differenti differentiating between different uh, spreadsheets is also a problem that we are yet to kind of really tackle. Uh, clustering is also something we could look at. This is, this is kind of an obvious thing that people would probably tell us to do. We have tried this briefly, but but not in great detail. And uh, the final thing is uh, we will, for a number of classes, we can actually, there are types of documents that are so standardized that, that regex would actually be better than, than this. Um, so as you stand up, that's me done. And uh, I guess I can say, are there, are there any questions?